How you doing? Back again, Lawrence McKendall, and we got the mic working, and we just introduced everybody, and so um, with the better, uh, let me see if I can even move this about so I can hear what I'm saying here. Um, gentlemen, you came in, you knew what you had to do, now you're really part of the conversation for the, for the playoffs. So were you coming in as a spoiler, or were you coming in going, we want to be a member of the playoff? We want to make the playoffs. Um, I think we came in this weekend and we knew that we had two tough games and we knew we had to come up with at least one or two victories and like we were really focused on just winning one game at a time, not worrying about what was happening today or anything like that. We just wanted to take it one game at a time. Yeah, very cool. Dan? Uh, yeah, we just came in. We started with, you know, the mindset of this game right now, <laughs> this quarter first, then the next, then the next, and see where it took us. Is, is it that methodical? I mean, really, uh, you're breaking it down by quarter? Yeah, we broke it down by quarter. Um, after every quarter, you know, we came in, brought the huddle in, and then went on from there. Very cool. Yeah, coming into this, I suppose we knew if we, if we won the game last night, we could still control whether we made the playoffs ourselves based on our results, whereas if we had lost the game last night, the only way we could make playoffs is if other results went our way and we got the wins. Right. So, you know, it's good to still have things in our control going into the last weekend. So I'm glad you mentioned because I was factoring in the Aviators, the Flamethrowers, and the Spiders, and I was looking at you guys sort of out of the situation, not doing the math that you were spoilers. And I'm looking at the numbers going, no, you, it's really your destiny is firmly in your hands. And, and after last night, definitely more so. So same, same response going in, X. I mean, you're going to have all the show after this. What was, what was the, the approach? Um, I, would, I would point to some of the stuff that Khalif and Mark told the team before the game. Um, what they did is they, they focused us on that game with some specific goals, kind of process-oriented goals, and um, I think they got us on the same page. We did, we did some tactical things that we needed to do, and, you know, um, it's hard to, hard to explain or put it in, like, put it in good terms but you know the energy and the motivation behind why we played last night or how we played um Khalif and Mark just took control and made us gel well you almost went a 3-0 I think uh what were you sensing from the crowd was it like oh what, what, what was sort of the feedback you were getting from the spiders and the fans when you guys came out so fast or were you just mainly focused on what you guys were doing yeah I, at least for me at least I don't really notice all that I'm just worried about how we're playing how our energy is on the sideline how our team's playing so I don't really notice all that yeah. too much who, who tossed that disc into the crowd I think it was Mark Mark, that was Mark. <laughs> Mark. Mark. Yeah. talking about coming to the stadium or when was that oh during um, when we're before the national anthem okay yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah, that's cute. well you know so <laughs> I I really I was curious to see what is going to be your strategy based on you, you, what you say, same sort of results as same process, quarter by quarter, point by point, or is there a sort of a different approach, approaching the flamethrowers? For tonight? Yeah, I suppose it's going to be similar in terms of like we know, we know with the win last night, we can't be knocked out tonight either. So, you know, if we lost last night and lost tonight, playoffs, we were out of it. So, right. you know, points difference, I don't think that'll come into it. So it's just kind of a case of look, if we get to win tonight in their venue, we get to they got to come up to us and beat us at home, so there's probably an incentive that if we win tonight, there's no reason we can't win next week, whereas if it's a close one tonight, you know, that doesn't mean nothing for next week either. Right. So. And you've demonstrated that you can win yeah. in the stadium at Laney. They've been very favorable to you. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm sure that's going to be nice. And I would, uh, I would say we're focused on some matchups, yeah. right? Well, like, I mean, you, you, you were talking about strategy last night that you didn't want to share. Do you want to share what your matchups are, how you're going to look at it? You've got some key matchups. Well, here, let's throw it this direction. Go. Like, Zach, when we played, um, when we played in the past, who, who do you look forward to guarding uh, um, against? Uh, last time I got to yeah. punch up a little bit and guard Joel and Cassidy, and that was real fun, really good learning experience. Yeah, and, good. Um, it's nice having Khalif and a lot of the other D-line guys to kind of be in my ear a little bit and help figure out how to play those matchups. And I think, you know, all of us look forward to. We see their roster and we know how stacked it is and. We just look forward to you know punching up a little bit and showing them that we're not going to roll over for sure. no, That's a great point. Uh, I haven't been around long enough to actually. <laughs> I've never played San Francisco, so I don't really know what to expect. Right. Well, they're bringing their A game. I mean, they've got their A players. They're very stacked. Yeah. 
Right, yeah, for me, it's the first season over here because I'm from Ireland, so pretty much most any time I get to match up against someone, it's against someone who you're kind of watching watching in the big games for years, and now it's just fun just to get to go out there and play against them and see how I match up. So so, so you sound very fun-loving, but it's always interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated when you talk to people that line up against Cassidy or Bo, or there's a variety of players on Revolver if you've watched them. <coughs> Do you check your awe? Or like I know this is a good player at the door, and you're there. It's just a guy puts in, puts on his pants, throws a disc the same way as you do. Or is there some sort of like, uh, I'm, I don't, don't don't be posterized. Uh, I suppose for me, it's a case of you know, if I go out there and this guy runs all over me the whole game, no one pays any attention. But if I do a job on him, it was one of those. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> no, that's a good way to look at it. Sure. Yeah, I think like. It's normal to have first quarter jitters, and I think we're a team that's known to have those a bit. But you know, once we get comfortable in the game, we're, we're just playing guys in shirts. You know. Excellent. No, very good. That that, that makes very good sense. So, uh, well, gentlemen, I, I did mention to prior that I was going to actually simultaneously be heckling them while interviewing because I was cheering for the Spiders last night. <laughs> but look, these guys ball. They balled strong. I like great play, and as you can see, they're character guys. So I want to thank you, gentlemen. I know you're going to go get something to bite. We're in Berkeley right now, so they're going to wander up in the campus and get a bite to eat. But I want to thank you for uh, joining on the show. And um, very much, and good luck tonight. Thank I won't you. be there. I'm going to be at a party, but normally I'm, in, I'm, DJ, <laughs> I'm DJing for the flamethrowers usually. But I'm, I'm hoping that they win, but it's all love, and I wish yeah. you guys the luck. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks very much. All right, guys. Thanks. 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 So the next part of this interview, we're going to be talking with X about what's going on. So, go on. We'll, we're just, we'll, um, we're going to jump we're in. in. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yes, thanks. we're yeah. All right, guys. Thank you. All right, so we are still, well, now we're back to like Regis and Kathy Lee now sort of situation. And um, we're checking everything. How you doing? Still with X. I know we got sharp shadows. But the content's still the same. So l let, me, let me jump in last night. And thank you. I'm really glad that you brought the guys to really highlight the game and get a perspective from uh, what you guys were doing. Um, so let's talk about you. First of all, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. When I originally spoke with you, I was um, getting, doing some logistics for uh, the Cascade Cup interview I was doing with some of the players that, that, that played in the game. And... Um, and it was nice, you were very generous with your time as well as Tina's time as she, when I spoke with her. And so one of the things in doing my research was you're a family that has a lot of values and vision. Uh, and that, I, I want to talk a lot more about this stuff, but I really, that was one of the things coming from business and design. I talked with customer clients about doing vision statements and vision statements. And it's interesting when it's one thing when you have a sole person to start a company and it's their vision. It's another one right. when you've got maybe two siblings, but you have a gang of siblings. And so how does that come about? How did that manifest? Yeah. Well, I think one important component was the way the five of us kids were raised together. So being visionary is one thing. Um, we were raised to cooperate. And speaking of values, I would say that my parents... Um, put us in a position to sometimes depend on each other, sometimes um, take opportunities to support each other, and, you know, go, you know, spinning from my memory, I'm thinking of the times when it was us five, and we would be moving schools, or sharing rooms, or cooperating on chores, or resisting my parents, staying out late and not telling them where we were. Whatever it was, we did it together. Oh, wow. So combine that with um, some of the I don't, I don't know where the five of us caught the bug, but um, we think ahead and we definitely get distracted. We get emotional, we get caught up in the moment, um, but we were also thinking ahead about our own relationships with other people and the next generation, whether that be you know kids of ours or younger ultimate players, kids we coach. Um, I'm not sure where that came from, but we think ahead and we cooperate. So I'm a member of five. I'm the oldest of five. And so oh, yeah. I, I individually like all my siblings. Collectively, <laughs> we are, you know, as typical, we, we've gone different paths. You scratch your head going, we come from the same mother. 
you guys genuinely like each other and want to work with each other. And yes, you have your idiosyncrasies and sometimes you, you bump heads. Yeah. But that's fascinating. I'm not here to do necessarily a, a, a therapy session, but I'm <laughs> saluting you because you guys have a mission and a vision that are going forward in lockstep. Yep. And so I'm in awe and I'm applauding at the same time. Thank you for sharing sort of the inner workings of how that. Yeah, I, I would say that Ultimate Frisbee plays into that too. Um, the five of us did stuff together growing up and we, you know, like I was saying, we thought ahead or we think about the next generation and the planet that we leave behind. Um, but we played Ultimate Frisbee and I think we learned how to be um, respectful of each other's opinions. And when I say each other, people on other teams, um, people from other countries. Um, I think that got ingrained to us pretty young through Ultimate Frisbee and the, you know, the self-officiating nature of it, yeah. the community-orientedness of the sport. Very cool. No, so, yeah. so, so when, did, when did the plastic appear? Who brought the plastic home? Believe it or not, it was, it was disc golf and freestyle oh. before it was Ultimate Frisbee. All right. um, and that was in Seattle. One of at least my role models is Mary Lowry or Mary Jorgensen. And she got, she got me excited about playing freestyle, doing tricks with the frisbee, and playing disc golf or frisbee golf right. where you throw the disc into the chain basket. And she also was a star ultimate player. She was captain and, and coach of Woman on the Verge from Seattle, the cool name. preceding team to riot. And uh, she just got me excited about those sports in general. Um, she, she modeled, she was also my teacher, by the way. She was my teacher in middle school, and she modeled some of the behavior. Oh, cool that somehow got me interested in doing it too. So, so you brought the disc home first, and then your older brothers became the freestyler? So in our family, the three yeah. older brothers are, we have three older brothers and two younger sisters. Right. So um, us older brothers got our hands on Frisbees a little bit before our sisters, but we all kind of did it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And my dad would argue that he threw the, the Frisbee pie to around. Funny. So you, that's very funny because I'm sure there's some argument you've had this same thing. That's very funny. So he says, oh, I've been, you know, I've been throwing the forehand for years. <laughs> Excellent. But he was, uh, I think he learned, really learned how to, to throw well after my sisters and, and I and my brothers um, started playing in middle school with Mary. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in talking with you about, you know, your, your formal years and, and, and and your influences. What I'm curious is not how you, not how you necessarily improved your game, though I am curious about that, is what were the touch points along the way that solidified spirit of the game or gender mm -hmm. equity or other things that said ultimate is bigger than just 185 grams of plastic? Yeah. Well, um, I started taking ultimate very seriously when I was in college, but I didn't go to a school that had a culture of athleticism like a lot of the strong schools out there. I went to University of Chicago and academics was important just like sports was. Um, however, um, I got ingrained with some, um, some alumni who welcomed me and my brother into a community of Chicago players who uh, you know, inspired us to keep, you know, keep playing and keep working at our game even though at the University of Chicago, we only played for one season competitively. Um, so when I was in college, I played, I played for Machine and a couple of my captains nice back team. then, Akira and Eric Zaslow and, and others over, over those couple years um, motivated me to, to keep improving my game, even though I was definitely the young buck on the team. And uh, that spirit of inclusiveness, I think, really rubbed off and guided the way I you know, pushed my own game forward over many years. Eventually in Seattle, and then eventually, um, you know, at my highest level of competition with Sakai, and here I am playing some games with the Cascades too. You know, it's very interesting. So, let's, let's talk about, I mean, the core tenet of, of Ultimate Frisbee is spirit of the game. And um, coming from a basketball background, playing a lot of pickup, you called your own fouls and went, on your way and so mm -hmm. there, there was sort of that they didn't have a name of it you just call your own files but when you come to ultimate frisbee and you see the implications that fascinated me but it, it became more impressive and more important to understand how how compelling that that facet of the game was is hearing 
what you've written about it, what you've spoken about it, other people around, uh, um, other people I've spoken to about Spirit of the Game and the power it can have. So yeah. t talk to me about, I mean, you've been able to, in various interviews, to really look at and examine it and actually yeah. walk the talk. Well, for starters, I think, right now I think Spirit of the Game is a great term. Um, there have been times when I've, I've been challenged by calling it that and let alone talking about it. Um, there was there was a conference when Will Deaver and I were talking. It was a USA Ultimate or UPA conference, and um, Spirit of the Game was the topic, and, and we were trying to figure out whether that was a good term or a bad term for the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, here we are with a self officiated sport. Um, rewind, you know, a, a few years here, but here we are with a self officiated sport, and we're calling this thing Spirit of the Game. And to people who are being introduced to the sport, that term Spirit of the Game. Um, it doesn't exactly describe what we're doing. We do have rules, and um, we choose to follow the rules and balance that with um, our drive to win the game. Right. There is a lot of self-officiation, uh, along with some input from observers. Mm -hmm. There are ways to cheat. There are ways to bend the rules in every format, um, non, you know, with without observers or with observers, with referees, with game advisors. And I think what, what permeates all that, whether you call it spirit of the game or um, sportspersonship, which is my, the, the way I like to call sportsmanship if I can, um, it, what permeates it all, I think it, it transcends um, the, the format of the game that we're playing in. And I think it revolves around the player's desire to, to think critically about balancing, you know, I want to win this game with I want to play in a way that's fair to everybody in our community. Right. And I emphasize our community because if we're playing against each other, um, it doesn't it doesn't singularly matter how I behave. What matters is is how I observe your behavior and your treatment of the rules, your understanding of the rules. Right. And I need to I need to mitigate my perspective of the game with your perspective in order to actually come to terms. We can have two very spirited teams. Um, from different cities or different countries play a very unspirited game simply because there's a, a different culture around the way the rules are followed or communicated about. Right. Um, and all of a sudden, the behavior we see is, uh, is not representative of spirit of the game or good sportspersonship um, because the individuals aren't willing to take that extra step and whether it's you know bringing a, a degree of humility about their understanding of the game or um, a willingness to, to listen to an opponent or to empathize a little bit or to you know think ahead about what would be good for your team and in that tournament and that season I don't know whatever it is I'm, I'm like easily digressing because no, no, it gets no. too complicated for me to, <laughs> to well, well think let, about let me just interject it. for a second and this is why I asked this is question because I know this gentleman is is taking a very simple term but they're swift waters when you go, and that's the beauty of Ultimate Frisbee because yeah. it's, it, there's a lot of, when you talk to different people about Spirit <clears throat> of the Game, you, you, get, you get people who are just fringy, win at all costs, but be spirit. I mean, you can see how they're phrasing it, and you're parsing every sort of gray area because there's people that come in and bend the rules and interpret it different ways. Um, and that's the fascinating thing, but I, I, yeah. I, I like to hear because you've given a lot of thought. It's, it was not a simple response. This is what it is, and and you and so, no. If you have more, if you can wax on about, because I mean, there's a challenge, there's a challenge with. So I'll step back to a play during during summer league. Yeah. Um, there was a dangerous play that came in. Um, did the person get fouled? No. Was it a drop disc? Yes. But was it a dangerous play that the guy flinched enough? because he thought he was in peril or endangered? Yes, and so you're talking about USAU versus WIFDF and, and you know, are you gonna argue or is there gonna be some humility involved? You could just see the, how, what, 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 was gonna, what was gonna appear at that moment. Yeah. And, I, and I take all, now that I'm talking to different people about the interpretation, I'm taking a, 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 a more input of like, well, let's look at the human dynamics that come into, it should be, you know what, my bad, you're right. We take yeah. the disc back. We dispute it and go back, but there comes with a, it's also interesting. It comes it comes with a level of discussion. Yeah. So let me ask you about that. Is the le is the level of discussion is the level of discussion 
people working through the, their humility or are they working through this guy's conning me or <laughs> are because lots of yeah. times I will go you know what you're right let's I just let's just send it back and keep going I just try to be, I respect the call and go on yeah others want to have that full-on debate right so well I think I think discussion is key and depending on whether you have an opportunity to <clears throat> turn and face your opponent and talk to her or him or whether it's discussion that happens after the game, I think there needs to be, it could just be body language. Sure. There's a lot of, in AUDL games, there's a lot of body language and um, integrity calls get used because one player sees that the other player is turning and facing and sort of like, you know, looking for maybe something. Like, like you you know like, what the right call, they made the wrong call, you come on guy, you can, right. And if they're, you know, if those players are, are close enough, <clears throat> then there can actually be a question and sure, an answer. Sure. Um, you know, in a minute, a minute ago, we were talking with Doc here, and, and Doc was involved in a play last night when um, this star receiver on the San Jose Spiders went up for a disc, and so did Doc, and there was contact, and there was no call, and the Cascades, Doc's a cutter, so he, um, you know, was getting ready to, to become a cutter, and meanwhile, the handler was already picking up the disc, so Cascades had the disc, and it took uh, two or three seconds in order for Doc to get a, get someone's attention. He was trying to communicate that he fouled the other player. And then it took a little bit more time for the referees to acknowledge that that's what he was doing. And with some persistence, it became clear that Doc was trying to use a, a specific uh, way of the integrity call. Usually the integrity call reverses a referee's uh, foul. I didn't know what that was. I, 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 yeah, I so Doc's here. here. I'm not sure if we're yeah, supposed yeah. to include him no, or that's, not. No, that's <laughs> cool that you brought him because like, oh, he's not here. I thought he was getting some food. But that discussion happened yeah. in that bizarre way. Yeah, yeah. And it actually worked. The referee did apply the integrity call, and um, it was not easy. It was not easy for Doc, I'm sure. It was not easy for the other Cascades player who was just ready to put the dish sure. in. Sure. Um, it was the third or fourth quarter, and we wanted to score that point. You want to come in for a second and comment on that one? What, what happened, Doc? Yeah, come, just, just, we're, we're talking about spirit of the game. We got Doc here. We're just gonna, uh, you know, briefly talk about you were imposing for for the benefit of the spiders. Yeah, the integrity yeah. call. Yeah, for me it was from seeing the player play and the way he played out. It was actually just his heel clipped, clipped my shin as he was. Um, you have to scoot in all bit. Yeah, his heel just clipped my shin. He's as, got a Spanish accent, as, so we'll forgive. As him. I was jumping up for it, and um, I could kind of see by his. His reaction, he was kind of a bit like, he, I didn't think he actually said it to me. He just he just seemed a bit annoyed that there wasn't a call. And it didn't seem like he was asking me to give it. And I was just like, when I had a second to think about it, I was like, the way it played out, I felt like, you know, if I was in his position and I had it, I, I would have thought, oh, I probably would have caught that. And something as small as what happened would, might have been the difference. Right. And I was just like, you know, at the end of the day, this is where it, what it comes down to the idea of sportsmanship in a game is, can you just kind of go beyond what's required if you think it impacted the play? So. That's great. So we're talking about spirit of the game. So so let me ask this. So is this something you learned in Ireland? Or is this something that's sort of being in the vapor of this gentleman um, and spirit of the game or domestic? So what, what is this? the whole idea of the game. It's kind of, you know, can you break it down? The only way this works is if, if, if people make the conscious effort to to make sure the right, the outcomes are the, the way they should be, as in... You can have situations where you can think you got away with one, and then, but if you if you think you got away with one, then that means you you think there's an opportunity to not get away with one as well. So, right, you know, I think I've, I've had a lot of integrity calls this season, and I don't know if it's because I'm maybe less used to the physical aspect of it here, but right. I just feel like at the end of the day, the the ideas of the game are the same everywhere. If if the physicality is different, I'm still kind of like you know. If I, if I affected the play in a way that I that I'd be annoyed if it happened to me, would I want to, you know, would I want to this? And you have to be the same for everyone. Right and it's, right on. So yeah, that that's interesting to see that play out in that particular way, because normally you see it face to face. Like you're you're making the appeal, like yeah. come on, man, you know that's wrong, and so you're you're hoping that you can elicit a beneficial. Uh, integrity call or there's a foul and a contest or no contest right and, and a right. lot of ultimate frisbee exactly so that's very nice so thanks doc for for yeah. for, for uh, clarifying yeah. that so that's yeah. really cool appreciate that's that again. um <laughs> yes he's, he, i knew he's going to be back in here he's, he's supposed to be where's our sandwiches he said he was going to bring okay um so thanks so 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 let's let's Discussion. step away from spirit of the game and talk about um gender equity this is where we cross paths 
Uh, you you have two sisters that play the disc really high. Let me ask you this: Without sisters, would you have such a broad view of the game? Um, I think without sisters, I'd be a very different person, yeah. and and I would also be thinking about ultimate very differently. Uh, both of my sisters have have brought to the table us five um, in a you know at, in the boardroom and at the dinner table um, in one v ones. You know as as we've gone about being siblings, they definitely have influenced me. And um, Rory was a captain of Riot for a couple of years when I was a new player on Sakai. And so um, some of the, our conversations would be... Our members are ballers. She's a baller. <laughs> they're, all, they're all ballers. Anyway, go ahead. So she, I would say that her um, leadership style on Sakai um, led, sort of led us to talking about some things that were really productive for just my, my thinking about myself as a player and about leadership. Um, and yeah, meanwhile, I was, you know, I, I uh, sisters and, and gender equity. I'm trying to, I'm trying to like. So yeah, step back in that because it's, it's, it's really important and you're very, and you're yeah. very, you're very passionate about it. And much like you sort of waxed about spirit of the game, you have through interviewing and media, you're very savvy about it, but it's sincere. It's not like rote. It's not like press replay and, yeah. and, and regurgitate. I mean, there's a lot of thoughtfulness involved. I do think a lot about it. It's and it's also it's also really personal, and I I think the sister's question is is spot on, um, because the way you know the way I I talk with other people about gender equity or apply it to what the Cascades do or bring it into the fold at a you know say at, there was a USA Ultimate convention in Seattle recently and the topics come up in many many ways. Um, I coach too, and it comes up there. That's right. Um, I happen to be at the one that came through the Oakland too, oh, so I got yeah. a smell. I got a flavor uh -huh. of what you're talking about. So all throughout, um, it is personal, and I think my my journey and my understanding of of what equity means is important for this conversation. Um, and I think that's going to be different for every person. My, you know, I feel like I I came to terms with, with what gender equity is and how it relates to me not very long ago call it three four years ago um, I think I knew what equity meant before then but I never really put the pieces together and thought about how you know I as a as a white male in this case as a as a male athlete have had a lot more opportunities and I've been encouraged by you know my parents and my my communities to excel in a way that you know girls just haven't um, I think my, you know, my, my sisters are, are white females, and um, they, fortunately, have been in a in a family with two parents and older siblings who have been supportive of them and have encouraged them to compete. But I, I can't say the same for everyone else in society. And I think I realized that, you know, uh, that there was a an extreme privilege in my becoming an athlete that just doesn't exist for half of our society and there are exceptions and in those exceptions you see really amazing female athletes who are um, who achieve just as much as the male athletes do <laughs> but there are just a lot fewer of them and you know behind us we're watching a, a boys baseball game right. and here in California there are probably hundreds of boys baseball games going on and a lot a lot fewer opportunities for girls to play sports. We didn't even time that. That's a great observation. <laughs> so let me just step back when I talked yeah. about having you with, without without sisters. Would you have this perspective? And even with sisters playing at a high level, you said only three years ago. I mean, very recently, you you sort of this came sort of crystallized. And, yeah. and, and a, so what was was it an observation? Was it a major appeal? Like uh, Chena said, this is what happened, or this? I mean, what what, what was that thing like? Holy shit! Uh, yeah. This is excuse my French. You know, this was uh, you know what was that aha moment? Um, hard to pin down a moment. Um, although I did just think of a time when I was in college that was a moment, and when the men's ultimate frisbee budget was relatively equal, almost the same as the as the women's ultimate budget. And while the men were consisted of an A and a B team, we're forming, we're expanding the men's program and trying to expand the women's program and. There were more than twice as many men playing ultimate at the same time as relatively few women. The budget was the same, and I was complaining about it. Um, 
I was the treasurer. I think my older brother was the captain at the time. And I was like looking at the numbers and I think I might have been buying flights for, uh, for Pres Day. And, uh, and here we men were spending a ton of money out of pocket and the women less so. And I, yeah, and I, I broke it down and I was complaining about it. And then it occurred to me, possibly through a, con a confrontation, like not a bad one, but a good one, um, it may have been a discussion with my brother and possibly with, um, with Megan Tormey, who went to college where I did. And she was the, the woman's captain slash treasurer. And it just, I think something clicked in my mind. Um, so, you know, if I, hey, here's a moment when if I, if I can ask any of our audience to um, have one of those realizations and think about how equity applies to your life and awesome whether it be question. financial yeah, or yeah. just opportunity based, yeah. There it was for me in college, equal budgets, and I complained about it. And I, I, I don't say that I regret a lot of things, but um, I should have been spending my energy elsewhere. And at the time, I think the concept started to started to percolate in my head, like, huh, you know what? Actually, back then, I, this is so many years ago, I can't remember, but back then, I hope that that those were the roots that have formed some of my perspectives today. Um, and uh, yeah, and just realizing. That's, really, that's yeah. really cool. It's so, funny how personal and, and like emotional the topic gets. And, no, very much so. And but it needs to go there. Well, you know? well, when we when we were talking about, I tell you what, I'm going to do. <clears throat> so we got the sun going this way. Let's we're going to do a dance as Let's we're going to continue our, our conversation. So one of the things that that came that came up in our conversation, and this is what happens when you have a, a live show. You we can we can bob and weave on a moment. Go for it. And um, a little bit better here. How about that? Yeah, so we have a little serenading rolling by. So um, how are we? Yeah, we're doing. Look at all that work. Hey, thanks, X. So um, I'm trying to remember what my question was. But, um, you know, in I'm trying to think we were talking about gender equity before we got in that. Um, and I was really digressing because of how personal it is and how the no, individual stories. You're not digressing stories. anywhere. No, no. This yeah. is rele yeah. This is all relevant. No, how how you got your journey and 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 you look. Oh no, no. So so a part of the conversation we had was is when you joined the AUDL, you mentioned you wanted to be at the table. Yeah. You wanted to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So share with me your thoughts about that. Yeah. Well, so the. I have some I have some thoughts and I also will speak on behalf of all five of us kids because we we agree on stuff um, or at least we understand each other's disagreements and then move forward with conditions so when the opportunity came up to get involved with the AUDL we saw it as a way to um, to steer the sport and being at the table is talking with other AUDL owners and um, shaping what our sport looks like in five or ten years because the AUDL is is a it's a powerful organization that is moving forward, and if we were to be a part of it, we can we can have a have control over the change and over the opinions and the things that we want to be better about the sport in the future. So we five were all on board for that. Um, there were some things about the AUDL and about I'll, I'll just say sports and gender in total that my siblings and I talked a lot about when we. Um, first got involved. Uh, a couple of us talked to Tim DeBio at the time. A couple of us went and had lunch with Rob Lloyd at the time. We learned some of the other perspectives of the other owners, and we realized that that being a part of this group, um, we could have some good conversation and progress our own thoughts in the way of gender equity, yeah. progress the way that the league in, in total cooperates and you know, understands and cooperates about gender equity. I say understand because the, the tool that I keep coming back to is understanding and discussion, collaboration. These are all tools that, uh, though it's hard to measure whether you're successful or not, I feel are a lot more important than just putting your finger on something and say, right. we need to be there, right. or this has to happen a certain way. or although it is sometimes productive to, to complain about the way things are, um, there needs to be a mixture of complaining about the status quo, um, you know, batting down, you know, what's been institutionalized, 
there needs to be a mixture of, of doing that and also thinking creatively and, and creating or doing something that takes a different angle on the same problem at the same time and tries to solve the problem. Well, in all the way you're phrasing things and the way you're looking, you're, you're taking a long view. Yep. You and, and in talking between you and China, you understand that it's it's not going to change overnight. But you're you're laying down the groundwork and the con, and, and the conversation and and making your points. And it might be regional. It might stay in mm. in Seattle. It's going to the, the cask. I'll bring it in the Cascades Cup. It's going to come down to San Francisco next year. So you're you're you. My main point is you you have a long game, and and you yeah. understand that. Yeah, and uh, and I think we also need to we need to keep we need to keep learning. Like I I wish I could say that our long game was going to work. In fact, it's it's a it's an effort. It's a plan. Um, it's what we're aiming towards, right? And we believe we're going in the right direction. Well, um, I guess I should say we're in the right game, but I don't know if our plan is going to work. Well, not just <laughs> so we got to keep changing it. I was I was going to say one thing that that just said that. You you you're a catalyst for a conversation. Yeah. You're a catalyst on a number of levels That's that right. that are beyond just your dinner table. You're setting up a scenario that these conversations on these topics happen far beyond the borders of your table, beyond the borders of your house, or beyond the borders of Seattle. That and that's important, and that's part of the long game that you don't see, but it manifests in different ways. But I want to say that was something yeah. I took away from the conversation. Going, we, we we create the conversations, and that is a part of a long game to have that. Yeah, and hopefully, we can motivate other people to have these conversations. Absolutely, you know? and that's what, and essentially, that's what I mean. That's what was my takeaway: is that you are the catalyst. You're motivating those type of conversations, and your hope is there, but it's happening. Yeah, you know? yeah. Hopefully, the more the more people have these conversations, the more they get to think about their aha moments, their, you know, their own personal experience with equity and privilege, and whether it be, you know, gender equity or race or, um, you know, there are, I mean, sportsmanship plays in too. Yeah. More of those conversations and those realizations, I think the more we're getting to where we need to be, um, let alone what it all looks like now, sure. you know, like, conversations are there we are getting someplace so so just to go back to spirit of the game and conversations and I'm and I'm somebody who goes you know I respect the call and go on but conversation and dialogue in the game when you step back in its purest form if you're like going to just make the call and move on I can be there but if you step back and look at the purity of the sport that people are actually genuinely trying to resolve an issue and there's two points there's perspectives of where the diss happened or whatever the play is and mm -hmm. you take it on you can come I mean and and the most equity equitable part is like you know what we'll just send it back and 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 uh, we'll dispute it and just replay the point and that's great or you go you know you're right and go on but there's a beauty of that when you can objectively stand back and so this the power of conversation Mm -hmm. is important so so I, I salute you and just say those are my takeaway in your conversations with you and your sister and going and that's how I looked at the long game you were not like this must happen you were very you were very thoughtful in your in your in your words and in, in your approach to all these topics but it, and you were like yeah and this is we're hoping that we have these conversations and, and they happen around and you're a catalyst that's what I say yeah. catalyst for these so uh, let me let me change gears a little bit and um, you got five ultimate Yep. So, so going back into your sort of your mission statement. So we're up against the power of my phone. <laughs> this is as long as these interviews happen. This is a beautiful thing. Um, <laughs> and there's so many more because I, but I really wanted to get into, into what, really the meat of what we talked about. Five ultimate. Yeah. You, you have more skin in the game. You wanted to be part of the conversation. You're making products. You're making cool. I, I mentioned that. I wish you had a part for a smartphone in it. Because yeah. I keep sliding out of my underwear as I'm warming up. And the phones keep changing. Sizes. Yeah, that's true. I know you're going to come back to that. Like, you know what? So, um, <laughs> but I, your 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 stuff is uh, is is exceptional, as you know. You you're doing really well. So, where did you start with your vision, and, and where is it now? And yeah. So before we run going out of way power, back, we go ahead. Yeah, my so my siblings and I were playing ultimate back then, and um, where where I was personally was I was finishing up my fourth year in college and I was working at the Italian Trade Commission um, because I'm an Italian speaker and, and grew up partially there and I, was I wanted to about that I was gonna say yeah. that in economics I was gonna say, how's that Italian working out for you yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Um, molto bene. So, sì, allora molto abbiamo bene. cominciato questa idea di Five Ultima. I know, you say one thing like <laughs> you think you know it in Italian and he's like, and I go, oh, I like it. And it, it, all, it got sparked at this moment when my, um, my brother and I were at club championships looking around and we saw all these Ultimate players who really wanted to identify as Ultimate players and they were, you know, at the time they were buying merchandise from, you know, the merchandise vendor. Um, but more importantly, we were standing there. Oh, that's right, because Machine didn't make nationals, but we had already bought our flights. So <laughs> we go. were on the sidelines that year. And uh, we just had this conversation about um, how cool it would be if Ultimate players could identify themselves as Ultimate players. And I'd, you could take that literally like a shirt that says Ultimate Frisbee or a shirt that has the name of their team on it. But, you know, indirectly, what we're talking about is players, you know, figuratively buying into the sport. Um, choosing to identify as an ultimate player, not just a person who plays a little bit of ultimate frisbee. Right. And so we wanted to create a way for people to be able to do that. And, you know, that's so that's sort of my perspective on it. Um, when the five of us got together and decided to start the company, we didn't know what it was called at first, so we, we just called it the company. And eventually we landed on five because it was us five who sure. sort of cool. like pitched in the ideas. Um, it, I think that it took a, a different turn and it still revolved around identifying um, ultimate players or helping ultimate players identify as players right. um, but there was also a certain sort of pizzazz and flavor that we five kids wanted to, to contribute sure. um, some, of the, some of the stuff that, that we experimented with and still do experiment with are, are weird <laughs> like we come up with weird stuff and it needs to perform well because uh, hey we five kids have always taken competition very seriously yeah. so whether it's the like super flavorful bright shorts that I might have played with uh, you know at Potlatch one year um, those shorts needed to perform if yeah. I was going to wear them they not just look cool sure. <laughs> so that was important to us um, it still is a, a pretty core foundation and the planning ahead and thinking ahead too um, in the greater ultimate frisbee apparel spectrum or just sports apparel spectrum um, it's easy to fall into the trap of a cool looking pair of shorts or a cheap pair of shorts right. that actually is not going to last or perform the way you want it to over the course of multiple seasons. Um, in our case, you know, that cool pair of shorts I wore at Potlatch, I also wore at Poultry Days yeah. and I wore at Paganello and um, I wanted my shorts to last. So we made a lot of mistakes earlier on figuring out what, what the fabrics were that would last and what kinds of shorts would work well over time. and. I would love, from a business perspective, uh, in a startup, being in a bear in startup, all that stuff fascinates me. So, but yeah. I want to, I want to shift gear just a second. You're, you're with Five Ultimate. Are you moving into a lifestyle brand? I mean, you're moving out be, beyond the borders of Ultimate Frisbee. Yeah, or I should say, people are moving that direction. Um, we, you know, we make, we made bright colored shorts right. and for the people dance would floor buy or the field. Sure, and yes. people would wear them a pot latch, and they would also wear them around. Yeah. Um, and. Um, it made it made sense to start making other items that people could wear on the ultimate field and wear around it just it was a it started with experimenting here and there and um, adding more items to someone's wardrobe was a concept that we had, that we reckoned with at one point if you know if as a business we can provide quality products that people wear on the field and if it's a five ultimate product that they can also wear you know on the way to the field on, and, and back or to work on Friday before right. you head to a tournament. Very cool. Those are all good things. Uh, and to your point about shorts, when I pull out a, 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 a shorts, I'm going to the laundry bath, I love good shorts that are nice, they're not there, and you're like, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. they're very, very pleasing. So I can understand that, that they perform, and they're like, ah, oh, they're very favored. And it's funny, maybe you, you gotta play ultimate, and if I'm speaking to the audience that plays ultimate, you'll definitely appreciate that. Spend that. a lot of time in shorts. Absolutely, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. That it's, it's, it's nice, like a nice suit. Uh, so. How's bamboo doing? Because you go, you oh, yeah. going into sustainability. Yeah. So Rory um, was in college and got a grant to go study um, manufacturing with a certain uh, material of her choice. She got a grant from Dartmouth, and um, she grew up. We have our family grew up in different places, but she speaks Chinese and chose to go to China, where my younger sister was in school and my older brother was living, um, and uh, go study it. And so she pursued that topic and found that um, bamboo is this awesome material Very cool. yeah. that sort of like apples and oranges, uh, you can 
you can have a great material and you can process the heck out of it and you can produce a lot of byproduct and waste and that can be just as bad as a material like cotton that is pretty easy to turn from cotton into fabric right but the fa the material itself is terrible for the environment um, or at least in moderation it can work but it sucks up all the water on that planet right. so those apples and oranges were the challenge and what Rory did was she found a different way to process bamboo in order to um, be overall better for the environment in producing fabric. It's amazing. So let me see if I can recite it. It, it grows without water. Yeah, what do you got? Oh, cool. But it's like you can. It grows without water or minimal water. Uses it's, water, but a lot less of it. A lot less. I mean, it's just like an amazing, yeah. like a duh sort mm -hmm. of moment. Now, now, how you're able to take this and create pulp that yeah. that can be made into uh, uh, clothing was cool. But when I, I mean, being again in the Bay Area and knowing about sustainability and, and green energy, green, and it was it was fascinating. To go, wow, that's it. So yeah. you're, you're alive and doing well. Any discoveries? Any sort of aha moments of going? This is this is what we yeah. found. Or um, the the bam boxers are the product that worked. He's wearing some bam boxers. Here they are. So he's moving our my audience into an X crowd. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. But look <laughs> at that. Okay. So cool. the the product that worked best were bam boxers, and yeah. it's because the technology is actually not there to reduce the pollution from manufacturing in the way that we want it to. Um, so it's in a roundabout way, the fabric that works is is, is for underwear because hmm. it doesn't look good when you make a shirt out of it. Hmm. It pills over time. Mm -hmm. But underwear works. Because well, you, interesting. So yeah. that's an interesting discovery because when I heard your sister described when she was being interviewed for um, some some uh, financial channel, Bloomberg or something. Oh yeah, right, Bloomberg. Right, yes, and uh, but it was interesting when she was spelling it out. And it was like, wow, this is really cool. Now, if you could really do something that, I mean, it's like somebody making making art or some sort of material from from a readily available waste material. And it seemed to be like it, it, it yeah. grows wild, it's easy to grow, it just seemed to be a great, great particular crop. Yeah. So, uh, no, fantastic. Yeah. Hey, and the right amount of pollution for the meantime is not zero pollution. Right. You know, we've got to find ways to balance different, you know, different resources and eventually get to a point where we're doing the planet less damage. Yeah. Oh. Um, or we need to harness more energy or have fewer kids. <laughs> No, exactly. So we're getting in a little bit of uh, uh, sustainability. Exactly, sustainability, <laughs> exactly, all the above. But, I mean, this is sort of the point at the top of the show is that you've got a family who's doing a lot of deep thinking. And, and I spent a lot of my life talking to my kid, do as I say, don't do as I do. And these guys can say, you know, do as I'm doing, which is, is quite unique. Yeah, guys and, and girls. Collectively, exactly guys and girls and um and and just and so I, that's the really cool thing so that you're doing so looking down the line with the, the with the amount of time that we have left on my battery life that's the unique thing about this um so what's what's anything you want else you want to talk about with your company yeah. with uh cascades any vision about any facets of the game um well we're we're on the heel of the AUDL postseason and USA ultimate season um, I think there, I think there's a lot of good opportunities for discussions about these topics now that we're all playing ultimate in these two very different ways, and the results matter. Um, that's, I think that's on my mind these days. Uh, we're, my sisters and brothers and I are also making frisbees, um, which is interesting. It's a, it's a business move to um, add a product, a really good product, to the marketplace and to promote the sport in a couple ways, I'm gonna watch our, I could go on about this one, but we, we're, we're trying to build a company that is doing a lot more than just selling frisbees. And um, think of Tom's shoes. So I asked him to open up, he opened up Pandora's boxes. This is very intriguing. So a couple things, you use Tom's shoes as your analogy, so, but what, what is not out there in a disc that you're able to answer with your product? Um, for starters, we need to make a disc that works for the players right now, and therefore our disc is actually very, very, very similar to the other discs that we play with. He's about to announce a disc square craft. disc. I know they're visionary. Yeah. No, go ahead. So. <laughs> but it is round. <laughs> it is round. Okay. It weighs 175, and it feels like any other disc you've played with. Um, it behaves a little bit differently in the extreme cold or the extreme heat, um, but ultimately, haha, uh, you can go play a game with it and... Um, the point is that you can you can play a game with a disc or you can buy a disc and you can contribute to the sport in a way that 
um, will drive our sport forward and will get more discs in more people's hands in order to grow our sport. So explain when you mentioned Tom's shoes. Why, why is that? Why is that similar to what your what your vision is? Yeah. So if um, on a on a custom order of discs, um, you can choose a beneficiary who will receive some discs after you order. Um, for a personal, for one disc that you buy, you can also choose, actually in that case I don't think you choose the beneficiary, but we're giving discs to beneficiaries as people buy discs. And, um, you know, it, it hurts the margin a little bit, but it gets at the core of, like I'm getting at the core of what we're trying to do, which is not just um, make money on Frisbees. Uh, I shouldn't even, I don't want that, that audio clip out there. But we're trying to build a company that's doing something good for the world by growing Ultimate. They have a long game. Again, I go back to this. There's a vision, and the vision is not just over, you know, a, a stock price. It's it's a, it's a long game. It's a long vision, and these are things like that 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 are testament to that vision. If I'm putting words in your mouth, this is my yeah. observation of what you guys are doing. Is that, am I correct or am yeah. I off? Okay, yes. Yeah, and the company Aria. Did I even say that the name? Anyways, Aria yeah. is the company. It, it means air in Italian, nice. so we named it that. Good. And um, you can write off your education, <laughs> your Italian degree. So, yeah, and Zalen, my older brother, is the one who's steering that nice. with input from all of us siblings, Very while cool. I am focused more on the Cascades. Right on. So he should be the next person you ask. What's Aria doing for the world? I would like to do that. I would like Calling to call you out, Zalen. Yeah, exactly. Even Chena too. I mean, if you're relevant yeah. to the area, I would love to sit down with you, your siblings. Absolutely, all yeah. of them. Um, so that's fantastic. So so let's talk about the Cascades. What's it like to be a GM of a, a pro team? Or mm. is it just like, it's like a club team that yeah. happens to be in the AUDL? Well, we, yeah, we're not, I would say we're definitely not a club team in the AUDL because we're composed of, of players who are playing on these club teams, Sockeye and Mixtape and um, Underground and Riot for Cascades Cup and Mixed Games um, and Voodoo and Bird Fruit and probably a team I'm neglecting. But we, uh, yeah, we're a, we're a team of players from different backgrounds and um, we're here representing the Cascades when we are on the field. And I, I say we because um, we, I play, some, I play some games and I played right. last night. Um, but I am the GM and I try not to mix those roles. And so um, I really defer to, <laughs> to Khalif and Mark when it comes to running the team on the field. Um, but I, yeah, I, I enjoy being the GM and being around these players who want to move the sport forward in the form of the AUDL. Sure. They're also passionate about the game, and um, it's fun to be around them. Whether uh, I'm, you know, doing the laundry or whether I'm, um, you know, like there are a couple of players who will help me out. Like Jesse Bolton is a computer science major, and you know, we we like to talk about uh, the business side and some of the analytics. Um, and uh, so I enjoy being around the players, whether it's on the field or whether you know I'm working on a spreadsheet. And uh, yeah, uh, it's not. I guess it's not much like another professional team in that the sport is is growing and changing very quickly. And so, yeah, the f we're writing our future as we as we go. So let me ask you a couple of questions. I keep going back to the batter. I keep looking at the phone, yeah. going, "Hey, uh, hey, minute. Matt, how you doing? I'm glad you joined us." Uh, so the qu the two questions is one um, analytics. Are there any? I go back to Moneyball. They were able to find analytics that really discovered diamonds in the rough that were that were mm -hmm. immediately lost looking at the, the macro numbers are there any analytics that you that you're able to use that reveal player stats that that show the worth of a player and they, do they exist mm. or you you know i'm always I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm always interested if someone who's able to find that nuance of analytics that are out there well for the okay so for context all the udl teams um we all agreed to do some things and in this case the audl the audl all of our teams We've agreed to, to buy into the stats taking. So at every game, we're taking stats. Um, both teams are taking stats on touches, you know, turnovers, completions, uh, goals, all these things. Defense, whether your line gets a D or not. Mm -hmm. um, so efficiency as a defender and also whether your team can score after you get the D. All those things are getting put together. And that's not super new. You know, teams take stats. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you can have consistent stats across the season for all these teams, I think leads to some interesting observations. And I think those need to be combined with some intuition, and I don't spend a lot of time doing that, but I know that there are people out there who are combining that intuition with the stats and um, you know, discovering some interesting things. 
So, sure. so okay, so then let's move into how do you do the delicate dance uh, dance of you've got club looming on the horizon, ADL championship is is mm -hmm. is peaking. Where do you deal with the delicate dance of allegiances and energy output yeah. with the ADL versus their their allegiance to club? Yeah, well, so for the players are playing a lot of ultimate these days, yeah. um, and. Uh, to add AUDL games, sometimes two games in a weekend, and an AUDL practice on top um, can be hard on a player's body yep. and takes a mental toll. So um, once club teams pick up, it just makes sense to moderate how much we do and what the expectation is for practice attendance and, say, what we do at practice. In the earlier season, the Cascades were taking practices super seriously everybody was there and um, we would really compete and learn together and move forward when the club season took form uh, the same approach would have you know would have pushed people away so um, I am not playing on a club team this year um, and you know Doc is playing for the Cascades but not for a club team in the States so there are, you know there's some players who have a very open plate as far as ultimate goes right. but um, you know, Tien, who was interviewed with us a minute ago, um, just finished a season with UW, and he's playing on Seattle Voodoo. Uh, there, there needs to be an acknowledgement of all the other ultimate that we, as players, are, are playing, um, and then we can come together and bring our best selves for the Cascades. So Titcom, the the statesman. The, el <laughs> the, the elder statesman, almost, or the second elder statesman of the Titcom family, but yes, I like how you 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 were about to run out and were about to shut down, but just a second, I just wanted to say that you you're